pistol caliber carbines, a lot of people love them, a lot of people hate them or just don't understand the concept. I see that in the comment section of my videos when I talk about PCCs, which stands for pistol caliber carbine. So um, yeah, I see people arguing for their benefits and I see people arguing against the concept saying it's just a dumb idea in general. It's not a new concept. Going back to the 1800s, when pistols were chambered in the same caliber as rifles in many cases, it was done for simplification. When you didn't have ready access to ammunition back in those days, you'd have to travel long distances between towns. It made sense to have a rifle and a pistol in the same caliber, and today the same thing applies. Granted, our towns are much closer, we can travel much faster, but still the concept of having a defensive handgun chambered in the same thing as your defensive carbine or pistol with a brace, there is a true benefit to it. Also, there are other benefits in the fact that many indoor ranges, at least in our area, won't allow for the use of centerfire rifle cartridges on their ranges, but pistol caliber carbines are welcomed. So there's a number of different reasons why people want PCCs, but 9mm and 40 Smith and Wesson, well, 40 Smith and Wesson's dying, 9mm, it's like, yeah, people want something more. Some people want more power. I want more power, and that's why 10 millimeter exists. And 10 millimeter in a PCC makes a whole bunch of sense, either with a pistol with a brace or a carbine. So what I have in front of me here is a Chris Vector. I've had this for quite some time. It's chambered in 10 millimeter, and this is an example of what a PCC would be like. Now, the full auto version of this, because of the NFA, we can't legally own, so we're stuck with just short-barreled semi-automatic rifles like this one. It uses standard Glock magazines, and it only has a five inch barrel. So when you're using a gun like this, you're not really gaining anything in terms of muzzle velocity. You're shooting just a little bit more stably because you can put the shoulder stock on this SBR in your shoulder, and then you can fire. Didn't even feel it lock open. Pretty abrupt recoil, to be honest with you. That was some Fiocchi 180 grain stuff, and it's stepping out at about 1250 according to the box. But 10 millimeter has some serious punch. It's good to 100 yards. You can hunt with 10 millimeter and take an ethical kill. So, what about a pistol with the brace on it that has an 8 inch barrel, so you have three extra inches of barrel, and you have the familiar controls of an AR 15? And that's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about the new CMMG Banshee in 10 millimeter. This is what we're going to be playing with this afternoon. On top, I have a primary arms flat dark earth Cyclops, which has the ACSS reticle in it. It'll ship with one of these SGM magazines, which hold 30 rounds of 10 millimeter, but it uses standard Glock magazines or Chris magazines, which we'll demonstrate here in a moment. I'm going to go ahead and pull that out and lock the bolt to the rear, just make sure you get the magazine seated. And this, ladies and gentlemen, gives you the familiarity of an AR-15, but it gives you a 10 millimeter with an eight inch barrel. And hopefully one day they'll offer it as a carbine. So let's take a closer look at the new Banshee from CMMG and 10 millimeter. Once I figured out my hold at 100 yards, I was doing pretty good. All right, so let's take a closer look at this interesting new firearm from CMMG. We were shooting the Banshee, and uh, we were using some 180 grain Federal, and we had this malfunction. So I'm gonna go ahead and see what the cause of the malfunction is here. 
All right, so it looks like it just didn't extract and eject the spent case. Now, I watched Iraq Veterans' video, and uh, here we go. And he had an issue with a case splitting. That one did not look split, so let's go ahead and make sure that's going to go ahead and chamber that next round. All right, it did. Put it back on safe, and we'll start shooting again. The malfunctions that we're having with the 180 grain Federal ammunition, which again, isn't the hottest stuff in the world, 180 grain bullet doing about 1030 out of the muzzle of a standard handgun, which is basically glorified 40 Smith & Wesson, it, it, isn't, uh, it isn't that hot. So we took a look at the buffer that came in the gun, and it's actually an H3 buffer. It's a heavier buffer than a standard carbine buffer. And you should be able to see that H3 right there on the uh, face of the buffer. Okay, so also in the box is a standard, let's try not to lose my bolt, is a standard carbine buffer. All right, so we're going to go ahead and cut this little guy out of his pouch here and swap him out real quick. And then we'll try that 180 grain stuff again. Okay, swap the buffer out, 180 grain federal. Let's try this again. Exact same problem. That's the lightest buffer weight. So the really affordable range ammunition. All right, so we figured out the problem. When the magazine, the SGM magazine was full, there was too much upward pressure on the bolt carrier for that 180 grain Federal to work. Once you got about five rounds into the magazine, if you load it with 25 using that ammunition, it should work just fine. Let's test that theory. We have the SGM magazine loaded up with 25 rounds of the Federal 180 grain range ammo. And let's see if the gun works now. Okay, it slightly overrode that round in the magazine, which tells me the bolt didn't come all the way back. It did kick out the spent case. Okay, and locked open. So it looks like six rounds is the magic number with the SGM magazine. So 24 rounds loaded if you're using the federal range ammunition. Let's talk real quick about the magazines that the Banshee uses and likes. Factory Glock magazines. The only problem we've had with factory Glock magazines, the 15 round flavor, is that they don't reliably lock the gun open. Chris, Vector 10 millimeter magazines. Don't use the 45s because they don't stack properly with 10 millimeters. You have to buy the 10 millimeter specific magazine. These hold 33 rounds and they run just fine, but occasionally it may not lock the gun open, but they work just fine in our experience. Now the Banshee ships with a SGM 30 round Glock magazine, which you see here, and we found that these always lock the gun open and run the most reliably with regards to locking open. None of the magazines we had out here today caused any, sorts of, any sort of feeding issue. We just ran into failures to lock open. So if you're looking for magazines for your Banshee, I know some people don't like SGM mags, these things work very, very well. I have five of them.
Let's try some Hail Marys, guys. 100 grain Underwood ammunition doing an advertised speed of 1825 out of the muzzle, which is going to be even faster out of the 8 inch barrel. 250 yards using the ACSS reticle in the primary arms for my wind holds and elevation hold. I want to say most of those hit. It's really, really faint and very hard to hear without the ears, but the ears amplify that distant sound. I heard a few tings. I think I may have connected with most of those. If that's the case, that's pretty impressive for the ACSS reticle and for that 10 millimeter reach out there. Now, granted, guys, at 250 yards, these rounds are shedding probably 60 foot or feet per second every 50 yards or so based on some of the data on some of the boxes. So at 250 yards, that bullet is slowing down a lot, but keep in mind, it's starting off at over 1800 feet per second. So it can lose some velocity and I'm really not holding all that high. I'm only holding about a man high at 250 yards and hitting the target. Let's take the 10 millimeter Banshee apart. It's just like a standard AR-15. You have a paddle over here, a ping pong paddle, identical to a standard AR-15. I'm gonna go ahead and lock the bolt in the opening position, make sure that the chamber is clear and we can start our disassembly, all right? So we just take this rear pin, pop it out. It'll cam open just like a standard AR, pull the charging handle to the rear and we're gonna take the bolt and carrier out. Yes, I said bolt and carrier. It's unlike a nine millimeter SMG or nine millimeter Colt semi-automatic carbine. It's not just a bolt, it does have a carrier, all right? We take out the CMMG AMBI extended release T-handle. Inside we have a standard AR-15 M16 trigger group. And so you can put a Geisley trigger in there, an Echo trigger, whatever you want. You can drop it right in. The lower receiver is machined to be smaller in overall length than a standard AR-15 M16. And that's nothing new. And back here we have a standard carbine buffer system. All right. The gun, it turns out, ships with an H3 buffer installed, but it does come with one other buffer in the box, and then there's an optional buffer you can buy for suppression. And this is where things get really different. So we've talked about pretty much the upper and lower. It's 7075 forged machined aluminum, upper and lower. Everything's rather conventional until we get to this part. This looks like a gas key, but that is not a gas key. That is just in there, more than likely, to keep the bolt from doing circles inside the receiver. But it is staked, but you'll notice there's no opening in the front. All right, this gun is a delayed blowback firearm. So let's talk about how that's achieved. First of all, you'll see that there's a weight that's roll pinned into the bolt carrier. On the back side, there's a, an angle cut, and this is going to be important when it comes to disassembly of the bolt and carrier. So disassembling, it's going to be very similar to an AR-15. You're going to start off with this god-awful cotter pin. I'm just going to give up right now and cheat and use a knife to help get it started. This is a launch Kershaw, by the way. Now, once you do that, your firing pin is going to drop to right there on that ramp that I just previously mentioned. Leave it right there. It's freed up what would normally be the cam pin that looks more like a T, this one's rounded and has a witness mark on the top that tells you which way the, the hole inside for the firing pin is facing. So right now it's running vertical with the carrier. I'm gonna rotate it so that it's horizontal. And then you'll see this big cutout and what would otherwise be a gas key. And this little guy will come right out. Now, You'll notice you cannot get your firing pin out. It can't travel rearward because of the weight that's in the buffer. But hold on, once you get your cam key out, 
Notice it just fell out. Once you start pulling your bolt out, it will fall free. Your bolt is definitely different because you have the addition of this spring. This is what pushes the bolt home. Now, it looks like it has traditional locking lugs that an AR-15 would have, but there's a major difference. Since this gun is not gas operated, you have to have another mechanism by which to get this thing to rotate its bolt and unlock. If you take a look at those lugs, they're square cut on the face. On a traditional AR-15 M16, they're square cut on the rear end. This has an angle cut to the back side of the locking lugs. So imagine my hands are angle cut locking lugs and the force is being applied this way. As the force is applied this way, it has a mechanical disadvantage and friction is gonna to start to push those two angle cut surfaces apart, at which point when they become free of each other, now the bolt and carrier can move rearward. That's how this concept works. And it's really, really cool. They did it with a nine millimeter. Now they're doing it with 10 millimeter, which is considerably more horsepower. And it's doing the exact same thing. So no, it's not gas operated. Putting it back together, is a matter of putting the bolt and carrier back in. Make sure your extractor, which is a standard AR-15 M16 top style extractor, you can take it apart by popping a pin out. Make sure it's facing the outside the ejection port. Line up the hole. Actually, before you do that, you have to remember to put your firing pin in here. And make sure that that spring goes over the firing pin. That'll make your life a lot easier. And then go ahead and, and push it back. Let that firing pin drop back. It won't fall out now because the bolt's holding it in place. There's the witness mark on the cam pin. We're going to go ahead and put that back together. Stick the cam pin in. Rotate it so that the firing pin can move forward. And everything about this gun is really kind of cool. I mean, granted they used 90% existing technology, but the one thing I can't stand is they're still using cotter pins. These and the T-handle are my two universally hated parts of the M16 rifle and pistol, or pistols, like in this case. It, it sucks, this thing sucks. And it is a pain in the rear end. For 30 years, I've struggled with these little cotter pins, trying to wiggle them and trying to get them to go in cussing, giving up, getting hammers out. So the cotter pin gods finally smiled upon us and we got it in there. All right, putting it back together. Very simple. Put the appropriate buffer in there with the standard recoil spring. Take a T-handle. Now, one of the nice things about this is with the AR-15, you're always shaking it, making sure the bolt's in the forward position. Because this one has a spring on it, it's always in the forward position. All right, and because it has a spring on it, you notice it sticks out a little bit from the rear of the receiver. When you go to close that, keep in mind, because they'll impact the lower receiver back here. So when you come back, this one, it is cut, so that it should slide by, but if you're doing it and leave it out just a little bit like that, it can bang into the receiver. So just kind of push it forward and it'll go back together much easier. All right, that's it. CMMG sent these T&E guns out to a number of folks in social media and probably to gun writers as well, and that's how I came across this one. So I didn't pay anything for this gun. It was sent to me for testing and evaluation. I've had it for about a month. Now the primary arms optic with the ACSS reticle, the Cyclops, I purchased through Copper Custom to put on here because the colors matched. I wanted to try out the little one power Cyclops with the ACSS reticle to see how it works. What I do like about it is it has an etched reticle and an illuminated reticle, so it works like a red dot, but if you don't have battery power, you can fall back to an etched reticle. Now the ACSS reticle is a little bit small, but totally usable in this. What you don't have is enough magnification to really push it out to extended ranges. However, we were able to hit 250 yards with this thing using some really high velocity underwood ammunition. Now this gun also is able to be suppressed, but we decided not to suppress it. I have no intentions of ever suppressing this firearm. If you wanna check this gun out being suppressed, I'm gonna put a card up above to Iraq Veteran 8888's video where he runs his 10 millimeter Banshee suppressed pretty much the entire video. So over the month that I've had this thing, we've shot it a lot, I couldn't wait. Uh, we were under what's called an embargo, we couldn't talk about it. 
we wanted to continue our testing. We've tied everything up. And overall, we've kind of found that the gun doesn't really like lightweight 40 Smith & Wesson type 10 millimeter loads. So if you're looking at American Eagle, anything that's doing less than 1150 feet per second or 1100 feet per second, it's probably not going to get the, you're not going to get the best reliability out of the gun. You're going to want to short load the magazines. If the magazine holds 30 rounds, put 24 in it. If you have one of the Chris magazines, it's 30, 32 or 33 rounds, short load it by five or six rounds, and that should allow you to cycle it with the carbine buffer in it. Keep in mind it comes with an H3 buffer as well. If you want to run it suppressed, then you have to buy the optional eight ounce buffer, and then you can run it suppressed, which is a very heavy buffer. So again, no intentions to suppress it. The ammunition that we fired out here today and throughout the entire uh, totality of our testing is represented here along with some buffalo bore which we're going to talk about here in a moment. The SIG ammunition, this is really good stuff guys. I've been shooting this for a long time. This is what we fired the most out of the gun when I first got it of and the SIG is 180 grain projectile doing 1250 feet per second and, and functions the gun flawlessly. The American Eagle uh, Federal usually keeps us in good ammunition supply. Uh, this stuff I actually had to purchase. I didn't have it on hand. And this is 180 grain projectile doing 11, I'm sorry, 1,030 feet per second. And this is the stuff that is what I'm calling FBI load, PUD load 10 millimeter. And that's when you're going to run into problems with full magazines. Fiocchi, again, 180 per, uh, grain projectile that's doing 1,250 feet per second. Another great ball round for the CMMG Banshee. The Underwood, we have two different loads here that we fired through it. Uh, we have a 180 grain projectile that's doing 1300 feet per second. So this is uh, 50 feet per second hotter than the other ammunition that we fired out here today. And then we have the 100 grain, which is doing 1825, and that's where we got out to 250 yards. And we managed to get uh, eight of 10 rounds fired on steel. And I attribute that to the ACSS reticle and how fast this bullet's moving. And last but not least, we were shooting some of the Federal, uh, this is the Hydra Shock, I want to say. Yep, Hydra Shock jacket, a hollow point, 180 grain. And it, just like its range ammunition, or their range ammunition, is only loaded to 1030, 1,030 feet per second. So uh, it'll work through the gun, short load the magazine. So in all, I would say the gun likes the warmer stuff. Get the 1,200 feet per second stuff, and you're not going to have any problems with the gun. You can fully load your magazines. All right, now that we've said that, buffalo bore. This is some of their 200 grain heavy loads. This is a 200 grain round and it's doing an advertised velocity of 1200 feet per second. So I'm gonna go ahead and load up a factory Glock magazine. That was a Hail Mary catch there. I'll load up a factory Glock magazine here really quick. And we'll take a shot or a challenge target down there at 100 yards. 15 rounds of the Buffalo Bore Heavy Loads. Ha <laughs> ha! I got this little hanger here. Jason's giving me a hard time because I keep misplacing my ears and I put a hanger on my belt loop so I wouldn't lose them. And I keep losing them. All right. <laughs> which one's which here? That's the SIG ammo. Okay, here's the Buffalo Bore. All right, locked open. Now, what you'll notice is the rounds of the spent cases were flying at the one, two o'clock position, which tells you you're shooting really hot ammunition. Now, I do have the H3 buffer in here. This is the standard carbine buffer. So I have the H3 buffer in there. The only other buffer I have the option of using is the eight ounce, which is considerably heavier. And I'm not gonna do that. The gun seems to be running just fine. So yeah, a lot of fun shooting this little thing. We've put at least a thousand rounds through it since we've had it of all sorts of ammunition and about the only issue that we can really see is it doesn't like the light loaded ammunition 
And then we noticed with some of the warmer stuff like the underwood, it looks like it's getting pretty deep into the primer with its firing pin. And we saw what looks to be like a couple of punctured primers. You can tell because there's a deep hole in there and it's, it's black on the inside, which tells me some gas was coming back through a punctured primer. But on the SIG ammunition and other ammunition that wasn't loaded that hot, we didn't see any primers being punctured. So we had no malfunctions, we had no split cases, we had no problems with the gun whatsoever. Guys, if you'd like to support us here at the Military Arms Channel, the best way to do that is to become a Patreon supporter. There's a link down below. We don't take money from CMMG, we don't take money from anybody. We are viewer supported. So if you'd like to do that, link down below, consider becoming a Patreon supporter. Also, we are Twitch gamers. And if you'd like to join us on Twitch, become a Patreon supporter and send us your PSN network name. We'll add you as a friend and you can join us on a live stream. And also guys, please swing by and check out Copper Custom. Thanks for 11 years of support and we'll talk to you guys soon. I know I got one extra magazine around here somewhere. It's the SIG ammo. I really like the SIG 10 millimeter guys, it's good stuff.